Please. Did, I've lost track of dates here, but did your children know their great-grandfather? No. No. Indeed, my wife did not know him. He passed the year before I got married. Um, but I was really lucky to get to know him, and he was a randy sort sometime. I mean, he was, he was a character. He was, he was a blast to be with. You know, I mean, I, I remember being in a swimming pool with him once, um, and there were two bikini-clad co-eds at the other end, and he turned to me, and he was in his 80s, and said, let's go down there and talk those two birds up. <laughs> and, you know, I, he, he was not your standard grandfather that way. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I apologize, but, uh, you know, I, I gave his, um, the, the talk at his funeral, um, his eulogy, and I had to get permission from my grandmother to say the things I did. Um, and she, she was a fabulous woman. And she, she gave me carte blanche. She trusted me. She knew how much I loved him, so it was fine. Please. It sounds to me as if his daughter, Ginny, inherited many of his characteristics, his personality, and his joie de vivre. I don't think she'll sue you. I think she'll actually <laughs> be appreciative. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. And how about the other two girls? No. They're very, <laughs> no, they're very different. They're, they, they, they take more after uh, his wife. Um, uh, so, please. Uh, Mr. Gepp, uh, my father died several years ago at the age of almost 92. And he was a highly educated man and uh, somewhat a cynic uh, in the world. Uh, but he used to say, somewhat jokingly, but somewhat serious, that what this country needs is a good depression. Um, in the vein that the, he could see this generation of, of individuals sort of not really appreciating what they have and, and what, we all have been, right. what we all have been given. And I wonder, is, there, is that part of the message in this book? It is absolutely part of the message. And I don't like messages, as, 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 as uh, uh, your minister declared in reading from my Wobblies piece. I, I don't like being a crusader, a campaigner, or anything like that. But yes, embedded not in my words, but in their lives and in their words, is a clear message. You know, they create the world's largest no-wine zone. You know, I mean, it is very, when I hear people whining about little things, and I think about these people's lives, uh, I want to say, you don't even have to buy the book, just read it. You know, because it puts in perspective the human condition. and and the courage, the, the fortitude, the stature of these ordinary people, and I put that in quotes, ordinary people, is breathtaking in many instances. Just breathtaking. And it really is where the greatest generation came from. And you read, you know, I read 150 of these letters and researched them all, and, and <clears throat> I came away extraordinarily proud, both of my hometown, but also of the country and of that generation. Um, and I have two sons, 19 and 20, who are much more uh, reflective of this generation. And, and, and I think to some large degree, I've, I have failed to pass along some of those values and virtues. I think that sometimes our worst enemy is prosperity, uh, or at least continuous prosperity. Um, if you don't have intermittent uh, turbulence, you don't really appreciate the smooth patches. And, and so I, I do think that that is very much a part of the texture of their lives. And I, I was really moved by it. Um, you can't help but be. You know, you read these letters and, and uh, um, <coughs> there is um, an authenticity to them. And one other thing is that, you know, in our day and age, if you have a hard time, you go to a psychiatrist, a psychologist, you go to a therapy group. They didn't do that in those days. They bottled it up. They didn't even tell their spouses because they didn't want to burden them. And they certainly didn't tell their children because they were trying to shield them from it. So they held it all within. And along comes Beaver Dot saying, tell me and no one will know. And, and they poured their hearts and souls out. So yes, you're absolutely right. And, and, and I hope, you know, I, there are a lot of reasons why I want people to buy this book. You know, I, I would like to retire and get moved to the Riviera or whatever it is, but, but there is, there is something in these lives and in this generation and in these letters that is of value. And if I, was, if I was smart enough to get out of the way of it, then it's worthwhile. 
you know, because there is real value in, in what they endured and the dignity with which they endured. In this day and age when we have tarps and multi-billion dollar bailouts and we're throwing tons of money at, at a problem, sometimes it has less effect than the five dollars that my grandfather mailed. Um, sometimes the small, the intimate, the community-based is more potent than the large number. What this book tells me, these lives tell me, is that there is a role for government to play. That's what Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the people of America concluded. What they learned in the Great Depression was that you can't make it on your own sometimes. It isn't a failure of character. Sometimes the deck is so stacked against you that you need a hand and there's no shame in it. And that, that revelation came to people in the Great Depression. But the book also is a testament to the importance of individual action and resourcefulness. It's both. It's not one or the other. It's both. And to me, that's part of what, what they tell me in their letters cumulatively. Um, please. Yes, I'd like you possibly to speculate a little bit on what the impact of these letters were to your grandfather. How did he integrate this into his own life? How did it impact him? reading about this and how did it affect his life where he kept this such a secret. Um, what did he do with this? I think that it had to mean a great deal to him. I think it had to make a, mean a great deal to him to be in a position to do this, given where he came from. You know? That had to mean, be something very special. And he knew all these people. You know, his store, many of these people that wrote to him came into his store in better days. And, and, and it's a small town. And one of the reasons why he couldn't reveal his identity is because if the people that wrote to him knew that they would see him again, they wouldn't write to him. You know, so there had to be this anonymity to immunize them. But one thing that he did, years later, he had a speedboat. It was a beautiful Chris Craft, wooden speedboat that, that, that um, uh, he raced um, uh, at Turkey Foot Lake. And do you know what he named his speedboat? the beaver dot. And it was a county away where no one would see it or connect it, but it meant something to him. I'll take a couple more questions and then I'll, I'll sit down here and, and sign. Please. Uh, remarkable. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Your father, your grandfather was what kind? What did he do? Was he a merchant? How did he make his? He had a clothing store called Stone's Clothes. Okay. And, um, he was twice uh, bankrupt during the general period of the Depression, once after 29, and then he recouped his losses about 1932 or 33. And in 33, it was actually a good year for him, amazingly enough. And then in 38, 39, when the second wave of the Depression uh, was hitting, uh, he found himself in, in bankruptcy court. Uh, it was a complicated situation. It wasn't just that he was impecunious. There were, there were other complications. but. Um, um, that's what he did for a living. He had clothing stores, and then later he went into real estate. Um, and and uh, but when he when he died on his way to work, you know, in his mid 90s, he was on his way to a shop that he ran and owned. It was a, a shop that sold pen sets to wannabe executives. You know, that's what he did. Uh, it was a little thing, and he would scurry up and down the ladder at that age. I mean, you know, uh, um, so that that's what he did. That's wonderful, and I was just, your relating the story reminds me of my great-grandfather and the stories I've heard through my father, who's now deceased also. But uh, my great-grandfather lost a lot of land, this is in North Carolina, because he owed a few hundred dollars that he supposedly had already paid but failed to get a receipt for. Yeah. Okay, so word of mouth was everything in those days. Right. So he came to my dad, and which was his grandson, and he said, Roof, he called it Roof, could you just, if you could just buy this land, you know, it would be really great. And my dad didn't have $300, and so my dad's telling me this story, and I'm saying to my dad, you didn't have $300? He said, but I didn't jump off the building and kill myself either. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did that tell you a story? It does, yeah. Yes. And that just reminds me of all those things. And of course, my grandfather was making white lightning all that time, but I... <laughs> this is what grandfathers are for, right? I don't know if you drank it or sold it. You know, I have to... T I, I just want to read... And, and then I'll take 
uh, two last questions. I want to read a toast that he used to give. Okay, so here, here was the toast. And he used to give this all the time. He was a simple, honest man. He never strayed. He never drank, he never smoked, and he never kissed a maid. And when he passed away, his insurance was denied. Because he never lived, they claimed he never died. <laughs> You gotta love it, right? <laughs> It'll take one, one, all the way in the back, and then I'll get. Were you able to figure out whether the 150 checks that he wrote represented all of the people who had? No, and that's a, a, no. He only kept 150 letters, and and the reason I'm sure is that he couldn't bear to have more letters that he didn't help. You know, I mean the burden of having those letters stay with him, I think would have been too much. And so he only held on to those letters of the people that he, that he helped. So, good question. And last question. Well, I remember you from three years ago because I was so impressed with your incredible search for the truth. And now this is in a whole other format, but I don't think it's um, just by coincidence that that final survivor surfaced at the very last moment, perhaps almost after the fact. I think that the universe is coming to meet you to say thank you for listening to the voices of people that have been forgotten. That's very kind. I, I, I have a, a saying that I pass on to my students in journalism, um, and that is that God rewards you for making the call after the last call. <laughs> Um, uh, Jefferson talked about how he believed in luck and the harder he worked, the more he had of it. And I, I do believe that, you know, I, I believe in sweat equity. Um, uh, <coughs> but beyond that, there was a cosmic element to this book. I mean, you know, I'm not a, a squishy, feely kind of guy, um, but, you know, what are the odds that after 75 years, this suitcase shows up, is handed to a writer in the midst of the worst recession since the Great Depression. What are the odds? You know? I mean, it was kind of meant to be.